Thank you, thank you for that. It's great to be here today. It's, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be in front of an NHS audience again. And um, what I'm most pleased about today is in, in the different um, speakers we have, it, it hasn't been all starry-eyed um, amazingness with, with AI. It's been really balanced and, and I think a real sober appreciation of, yes, there's some great opportunities, but of course there are some things that we need to get right. There are some challenges that we need to address if we're to actually seize those opportunities. Uh, so what I want to do today is talk about one of, one of what we think is one of the big opportunities and one of the big challenges is that unless we are really ethical in the way that we actually deploy and develop artificial intelligence, we, we just won't have the impact that, that, we all want to, that we all want to have, that we all see in some of this amazing research. So I'll talk about three things. I'll have a brief introduction to, to us as Alpha, uh, then talk a bit about um, what we're doing and ethics, and then finally, and most importantly, I think for us, is end on some of the challenges that, that, that we're seeing, that, that, we're, um, that we're learning, the lessons that we're learning. So in terms of us, so Alpha is, is part of Telefonica. Uh, so Telefonica owns O2 in the UK, and, and we're based in Spain. And Alpha is, is part of Telefonica's innovation uh, group, and we're the part that does um, what they call in the jargon of Silicon Valley moonshots. So the idea is that we are supposed to tackle global problems that affect hundreds of millions of people, and then use technology to develop breakthrough solutions to, to those challenges. And I work in, in Alpha Health, and a few colleagues here today. So our, our vision is that we want to give a billion people an additional five years of health by, by enabling them to adopt healthier habits. And, and our mission in doing that is, is to build a personal health assistant. Because we're focused on healthier habits, we really want to understand um, people's behavior and what drives it, and then really support people to move along an effective path. And just to give you a brief overview of, of some of what we're doing uh, to provide context for, for what I'm about to talk about in the ethics. So we have, at the moment, we have, we have four products in our portfolio and, and we range across different levels of acuity. So we start off with a, a product we have at the moment in beta called Evermind, which is really about self-care. This one is aimed very much at stress and helping people with, with stress, um, starting with, with the workplace. And then we have a series of more clinically focused uh, products. So Perspectives is digital CVT that, that is unsupervised. And so this is going through clinical trial in the US at the moment. And um, the idea is that, of course, because it's unsupervised, you can use it all the time in, in your home, wherever. Uh, and the data we have at the moment is, is, is very promising about um, how effective it is. And then we have it, its sister product, which is Mindset, which is, again, digital CBT, but it's, it's supervised. And the idea behind this one is that for more serious cases uh, of, of, of mental health, um, what we really want to, to do is still be able to provide clinicians with the support that, 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 they, um, that they need um, so that they can offer their patients care 24-7, because, of course, you can't be in front of the clinician all the time. And then finally, we have a product called Foresight, which is really about predicting crisis. Uh, and this is something that we are we're still in development. Uh, we're doing this with Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Foundation Trust up in the Midlands. Uh, and the idea here is, is can we use uh, the electronic health record to actually understand whether someone is about to go into crisis or not? Because, of course, if we can predict crisis and we can then offer someone help before they have that crisis, that's amazing for that individual and of course good for the health system as well. Um, we have a challenge session later on after lunch today, challenge session six, and uh, you can learn a little bit more about that there because we're gonna use that as a case study of, of ethics in practice. Um, but let me, let me talk a bit more about ethics and, and why it's important to us. And, and there's, really, there's really three reasons why we think if we, if we don't think about ethics and deploy an ethical approach, we're just not gonna have the impact that we want. So the first is credibility. Now, I mentioned before, um, we are working with a trust in, in the Midlands, uh, in Birmingham Solihull Mental Health Trust. And when we talked to the clinicians there about the predictive analytics work, they said, look, the only way we're going to use this is um, if it can explain to us, if the algorithm can explain to us why it's actually suggesting that this patient, one of our patients, is actually about to have a crisis in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we said, okay, that means we can't use certain techniques. We can't use deep learning, for instance, as a machine learning technique. Um, 
I'm not saying you can never learn, you, you can never use deep learning, but in this instance, the clinicians were just absolutely adamant. They said, you, ca you can't use it. Um, so for them, it just wouldn't be a credible product if, if, we, if we were trying to do that. And so we ended up um, we were using tree-based approaches for, for this. And we feel in this instance, we, we haven't really lost anything in terms of the, um, the accuracy. Second reason is, is, is effectiveness. And so I mentioned that the, the product before the Evermind, and, and, and this is really trying to help people with stress. And part of the evidence base that, that, that we've looked at um, in-house, of, of course, is um, uh, journaling is, is, is one of the uh, types of interventions that, that works really well. So if we're offering Evermind to, to you and, your, and your, your employers offered that to you and you're stressed at work and, and we're asking you to do some journaling, you're obviously going to write down in the app, OK, I'm, my boss is being really irritating today or he set me some ridiculous task and it's just impossible to me. You need to be really sure that that, that data is not going to leave your phone. It's, it's not going to go anywhere near your boss or your employer more, more generally. And if you don't believe that, if you don't trust that, then you won't use that particular tool. You may not use the app at all, and therefore the app just will not be effective. And this really leads to the, the third reason why we think that, that being ethical and, and deploying an ethical approach is fundamental to impact, because you're just not gonna get access to, to the data rightly. If people don't trust you, they won't, they won't consent to, to that access. Uh, they won't sign that contract. Um, so if we can't do that, if we can't get that data access, then you obviously can't train the models and you can't develop and then deploy the, the artificial intelligence. So that's why this is so important to us. So how do we do it? Well, of course, of course, we have an ethical framework. Everyone has an ethical framework. Um, but I don't actually want to talk about that so much. I wanted to talk about some of the things that we are doing as a result of that framework, because I thought that would be more interesting to you. So, one of the uh, examples of our work is, is um, we think it's really important to try and be as, as understandable as, as we can be. We think that that's really important in building trust. Uh, and so we've played around with different design patterns to actually show people, well, this is actually the data that this app's going to collect. So the, the picture you've got here is of, um, is of a prototype we're building to do with sleep, um, where rather than just have a long list of here are the sensors that we're using, um, we said, well, actually, let's just have a, have a diagram and a, a little picture to try and describe it. Uh, and this, this um, developed really good results in A-B testing, and, and um, so we then actually were pleased to use that in the application. The second example in the, in the middle is, um, I said before, the clinicians were adamant in Birmingham that you have to be able to explain the algorithm. It's no good just using a deep learning technique. But of course, for some data sets, you, you really would quite like to use a deep learning technique because it, it can be very powerful. Um, so there's a, a part of our work in, in our AI lab in Alpha Health where we have a big focus on explainable AI and actually trying to say, do we need to make this trade-off between uh, the, the performance of algorithms versus the explainability of algorithms. So one of the pieces of work that the team has done is, is they're able to take a neural network and turn that into a tree-based model. Uh, and a tree-based model is, is, is just much more explainable. It's not a black box. Um, and we don't lose too much in terms of the, um, the accuracy of this. Um, and so we think this is a a really nice way of starting to try and bring together the idea that you, you can have this ethical approach, you can build trust, and you don't have to lose performance. You don't just have to rely on, on a black box. So we can't do it for all neural networks, so, so, so the work is still ongoing, but um, we can do it for some. And then final um, example of, of, of success um, that we've had is we... Uh, we audit our work. We have our work audited externally by a, a company called um, Etigas, which is, which is an ethics consultancy, which is a, um, a job, a, a business I'd never even heard of before I, 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 I joined Alpha. But they, a few of them do exist. And Etigas is, is great, based in Barcelona. And, and they reviewed um, all of our previous prototypes um, over the last year, 18 months. And they also undertook. Um, an audit on the algorithm, the potential for algorithmic bias, I should say, in, in one of our prototypes. Um, and this has been hugely, hugely valuable because no matter what you think about taking an ethical framework that you've developed 
no matter what you think about how well you've deployed that, you will never have done it as well as, as you might have done. And so having this external input is, is absolutely vital. Uh, and this is really um, what's led us to some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, and this is where I really want to um, share, some, share some thoughts with you. So the first one is principles can conflict. Now, this is, is kind of obvious. And when I describe this, it, it, you're probably going to think, well, yeah. Why didn't you think of that in the first place? Well, we didn't think of this in the first place, um, and it was something we learned through the algorithmic audit. Um, so we, um, last year, the beginning of last year, we were testing some, some ideas in a prototype, um, a prototype version of Evermind. Uh, and we had a, an app that was a, a recommender system, so it was uh, helping people with their well-being, and people would say, well, I, I'm feeling bored, or I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling upset, and I want to feel differently, and then it would provide recommendations to them. So at the heart of that application was, was quite a simple recommender system. Uh, and we wanted to understand, well, was that biased in any way? Um, was it providing recommendations to um, one group that might disadvantage them? Particularly, was it providing disadvantaged groups recommendations that would disadvantage them further? And so this is when Etikas, supported by the University of Pompeii Fabra in Barcelona, looked at this work. And the first thing they said was, you guys have done a really good job at data minimization. You've done a fantastic job, because you haven't collected any personal data. You haven't looked at gender, you haven't looked at anything like that. That's really good, well done. Your lawyers must be thrilled at how well you've complied with this aspect of GDPR. But because of this, you have no information about whether you would be biased, no direct information about those groups. So we can't actually do a direct analysis on this. This was something that, that, that Alison mentioned in her, in her presentation earlier before the break. And it's, 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 it's such an obvious point when you say it, but it's, it's, it's hugely important. So what we recognize is that, oh, wow, we've actually ended up privileging data minimization as a principle, and we've therefore not been able to really pay much attention to, to bias as a principle. And, and we can't blame GDPR. I can't blame the lawyers. Of course, I'd, I'd love to. Um, but we can't blame the lawyers, because GDPR also it's clear that you should think about fairness and you should think about accuracy as, as well as privacy and data minimization. So it's, it's not good enough just to say that you, you can focus on one. Now, what we were able to do in the end with this work is actually use some indirect methods. Uh, so we used uh, some ethnographic work internally. So Etikas and, and the University of Pompeii Fabra interviewed us. They looked at all of our documentations. They looked at some of the comments that had been made in Play Store uh, about the work. And from that, they were able to say, look, actually, we think in this instance, you're OK. And, and there, was, there wasn't really strong evidence of bias. Had there been, their next step would have been to recommend that we would actually collect some of that personal data. We would take a subset of users, and we would ask them whether we could collect that data. Um, so it's not the case. I'm not saying that in this instance, we should have collected all that data in the first place from all users. That definitely wouldn't have to be the right answer. It could have been an answer. It might have been just actually you, you take a subset of, of your users, your, your customers, and you just ask them. I don't know whether this is really obvious to you, that, that principles can conflict, but this is certainly something that, that, that we learned from that audit. And now we know we need to think up front, how do we balance these, these different principles? The other lesson that we've, we've learned, and this is much more recent, is when you have an ethical framework and you're trying to develop that and deploy it, it's, it's kind of all or nothing. So we, I mentioned we, 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 have, a, we have a framework, and it, it includes um, supporting people to be healthy and happier, putting the user in control, being transparent and understandable, uh, being secure with your data, and then being accountable. And as you would imagine, you take that as a framework and you think, well, OK, how do we then deploy that? And so you develop plans, and, and you recognize that some things might be a bit easier to do than others. Some might be more technical. So you end up having a, a plan with a Gantt chart like, like you normally would. And the challenge of that is it, is it leads to an approach that can be um, 
different aspects can move at different speeds. And this is where the all or nothing challenge comes in, because in a sense, you, you cannot be half ethical. So if you said you have all those principles, those five principles in our case, you can't say, oh, well, at the moment, we're only really doing four of them, uh, and then the other, we're going to get to the other one in a few years' time. Is, is that all right? You can't really do that. So for us, what we learned recently, um, that this, this was um, an area where we were less good on in the last year is on the transparency side. So the work on, on the, um, we were doing with Birmingham, um, we talked about that a lot, that project, in the Birmingham area um, with colleagues in, in the NHS uh, and with patient groups. We hadn't really done a lot about talking about it outside of that. Um, and then so recently, when we were in the media about this, we thought, oh yeah, we should have been a bit broader in our communication strategy on this because we were just busy doing, doing other things. And so we, we, we have to recognize that we got that wrong. We should, we should have actually been um, more communicative about this more broadly from the beginning. Um, and for that reason, this idea of we, you, have to, you have to do everything all at once is really important. But then you have the question of, but how much is the right amount to do at any point in time? It's, it's, it's kind of the, the when do you ship question that, that you always have when you're developing a, a product. You know, when, when do you get it out the door? When does perfect be the enemy of good enough? An example of this we've had recently is, is um, actually for that application Evermind uh, that I mentioned before. Um, we are really trying to simplify privacy policy in terms of conditions, because they're awful, right? Everyone's had the experience of just saying, yeah, I'll just click yes. I'll just click yes because I just want to get through to the application. And we've almost become trained just to do that now. But it's just really not good enough, because within those policies, there are important clauses that you, you need to understand that talk, talks to you about how your data is being used and what your rights are. So we're really trying to push on how we can simplify that as, as part of being understandable and, and transparent. And we've got, so, I've got some way with the lawyers, so we sort of have a summary version, but I'm really, really pushing the lawyer to have a full version that's just plain English language. So he, we're having this debate about whether plain English language can exist in a legal contract, or whether legal contracts have inherently some legalese words that you just cannot get rid of. Um, that debate's ongoing, but we have a product in beta. Should I wait and have a, just a really um, classic version of a privacy policy in terms of conditions that's actually not very transparent, not very understandable, and wait until I've got everything sorted, or should we just do it in a more incremental um, pace? And we've chosen to do it in a more incremental way so we get some of it out there. Um, but it's never really clear what the right balance is, and, and that's just one of those judgments you have, you have to make internally. So we've, we think we've made some progress. We've definitely made some mistakes, and we've learned some lessons along the way, but we think we're making progress, and we think we have to make progress, because this is so important. For the reasons I, I talked about earlier, for, for credibility, for effectiveness, we are just not going to be able to have the impact that we want unless we develop and deploy a hugely ethical approach to, to technology. And we don't think we should be alone in this. We know there's lots of other people working on this. And I think it's a journey that we all have to take together because we all want the technology to have to have that impact. We all, we're all here because we think there's a great opportunity. So I think we all have to work together on this. And what I would really welcome today is, is people's questions, comments, the lessons that they've learned so that together we can all move forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>